I'm Dr. Nick Begich, and I'm a researcher in a number of technologies. I serve as the executive director of the Lay Foundation on Technologies. I'm also the chairman of uh, Earth Pulse Press, a publishing company dedicated to getting issues out um, that are obscure and unusual. Um, our hallmark is footnoting. Everything that we publish is, is extremely well footnoted with mainstream media reports, uh, technical documents, military records, and the like. And, and we believe that's important because when you deal with startling subjects, you're into areas where you really need that evidence so people that are interested and, and policymakers can look at these issues and really move change. You know, the most controversial issue that we've dealt with over the last 10 years is this idea of physical control of the mind, being able to manipulate what happens within the brain of human beings for specific applications, whether they be to degrade human performance or, in many instances, enhanced human performance. Several years ago, we were able to take a device to the European Parliament uh, while we were testifying on another issue that we've covered over the last decade, the HARP uh, controversy, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. But we had them broaden that agenda in order to cover other issues, such as this whole concept of interfering with human brain performance. And we took with us an, what's called an infrasound device. You see it in the literature from time to time. This particular device was made essentially in a garage uh, by, uh, I would not say amateurs, certainly professional scientists, but we were able to show how infrasound works and demonstrate that in the hearing. And from, we were given initially 15 minutes, they expanded that to an hour and a half and let us do a full presentation on the effects of these technologies. And as a result, in the, in the most significant security and disarmament uh, resolution ever passed by the European Parliament, a major section lays out um, a call for international treaty bans on this technology. In the book, Earth Rising, the Revolution, we actually have a chapter dedicated to this subject. And let me kind of tell a little bit about sort of how this works. You can affect um, the human brain by external oscillators, fields that vibrate, if you will. And, and so you can use a lot of different things. I mean, you see, and some people have seen, the light and sound devices, where flickering light at a certain pulse rate will cause uh, within window frequencies, chemical reactions within the brain that literally change your emotional state, your brain state. And, and, and the human brain really operates in four ranges. If you start at the very deepest, deepest states of sleep, you're at delta, approximately one to four hertz. Hertz are vibrations per second or pulses per second. So you can go one to four, that's where you are when you're very deeply asleep. The next level approximately 4.1 going up to uh, about 7, a little less than 7. This is a theta range. This is where you are when you're kind of between that awake and asleep state, where you're sort of aware of your dreams. This is also where three to five-year-olds spend most of their time, which explains an awful lot when you think about kids trying to figure out what's imaginary and what's real at those ages. It's because of where their brain activity is. It makes it very difficult to distinguish. The next level, the alpha level, is a very important uh, level. The Earth actually has a frequency of its own. It's called Schumann's resonance. It was discovered in Munich, Germany in the early 50s, 7.83 hertz, pulses per second. This is right in the alpha range, which is where athletes talk about the zone or creative artists talk about being in that in sync, you know, and writers have that certain flow of creativity. It's in that alpha range where this occurs. This is the ideal state for learning, um, for simulating lots of information, um, and, and, and some of the anomalous things that happen uh, in human brain performance. Above that is beta. This is where people are when they're actively engaged in most communications. And high beta is where you are when you're highly agitated. So these external oscillators send signals in at these specific frequencies that then the brain entrains to, locks onto, and begins to mirror. And as it does, you get the very dramatic changes in brain state. When you go back, uh, to 1969, uh, the work of Jose Delgado, who was uh, an electrophysiologist. He was educated with a degree in electrophysiology from the University of Madrid in 1950. He then went to Yale University and began mapping the brain of primates, humans, um, and, and other animals to see uh, what parts of the brain would stimulate various activity. And in those days, 1969, he used implant technology to stimulate. You know, then he used a radio frequency transmitter, sent a small electric current, caused certain effects. And he demonstrated some of these effects. In one instance, uh, in a book called Psycho-Civilized Society, published uh, in 1969, written by Delgado, he shows an image of a charging bull. And he throws the switch as it gets a couple feet from him, and it stops. Not dead, but dead in its tracks. <laughs> it stops. He then continued to evolve the technology. And by the mid-'80s, he reported in, in, in scientific literature the fact that he could create the same effect 
with no implant at all, no physical contact with, with the subject, and he was able to take primates and humans from lethargic, passive, to highly aggressive, like flipping on and off a light switch. And what he used was a, was a uh, radio frequency at 1 50th of what the Earth naturally produces. Now let me put that in perspective. When you think about where we're all standing right now, wherever we are on the planet, there is 200 million times more radio frequency energy around us than what the Earth produces. And yet, 1 50th in the right window frequency can trigger these cascades, this change in brain activity. And what they found is certain window frequencies, certain frequencies were active. It's almost like, in fact it is like, dialing through the radio station and you get resonance between the transmitter and receiver and you get a nice clear signal, everything's working together and you get the signal and you hear the station. In between is static. Well most of the energy around us is the static. But when it hits these frequencies, tremendous changes can occur. Many will remember a number of years ago an incident in Japan where they were showing a cartoon on television, kids sitting you know, reasonably distant and the idea is the energy dissipates, it's very little energy by the time you're 10 feet away. But the flicker rate sent 700 children to the hospital with epileptic seizures and it was thought to be harmless. It's not harmless. It's the frequency that's relevant. And so the military, back in 1985, contracted the University of, of Utah to put together what's called the Radio Frequency Do the Dosimetry Handbook, which is the dosages of radio frequency energy and what kind of energy, and what waveform shapes, pulse rates, etc., affect each organ of the body, from the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs, so you can override those natural functions with these external signals to either degrade the organs or improve or stabilize their function. Unfortunately, most of this research rests with the military, and as a consequence, it's used for the wrong applications, in our opinion, because these, these breakthroughs could offer great opportunities uh, in the health professions and in other professions in really overcoming the problems uh, that the world is facing today. When you think about um, radio frequency energy as a, a means for influencing behavior, you can go back to 1973, and there was a book called Between Two Ages, written by Zbigniew Brzezinski, when he was at Columbia University, this is before he became National Security Advisor to U.S. President Jimmy Carter, and what he said in, in, this, in this book, and if you look it up, you can find it, I think it's on either page 56 or 57, it's right in that range, and you'll see this quote where he says, if we can ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere, this layer that begins about 30 miles above the Earth's surface that's responsible for the character and quality of radio transmission, if we could ever trigger that to oscillate in such a way, he said, we could, we could alter uh, the emotional state of large percentage of the population over huge geographic areas. And he was quoting from J.F. Gordon MacDonald, who was a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson and a professor at UCLA, who had written about this concept. And the oscillating of the ionosphere is now possible. Through our earlier work on HARP, and those interested in that can go to our website, get plenty of information, and begin to understand that issue. But the book itself contains 350 footnoted sources that really get into the meat of, of this issue. But, but mind control, we consider, for us, our next effort, because HARP was a major effort over 10 years. We're continuing that effort. But this idea that people can artificially interfere with human brain performance, thereby interfering with free will, is something that in most religious traditions, even God won't do. And yet our government is pursuing this for the interest military interest rather than enhancing human performance. On the other side are the civilian researchers. You have researchers that have developed bioral beat, which is a patented technology, which creates, you know, the ears, we can't hear these very low frequency signals. Our ears just don't work at those low frequencies. So what happens with bioral beat, you send a signal in at say 16,000 hertz or pulses per second or vibrations per second in one ear, 16,000, 16,000 and say seven in the other, they cancel and leave a beat frequency of seven hertz. The brain locks onto that frequency. Both hemispheres of the brain begin to resonate together, which means the creative side and the analytical side are working together. It elevates IQ. It brings the best of intuition with the analytical mind. What, what the creator, however we perceive that, really intended, both sides to work together. And little children, you see that. You see energy distributions across the brain relatively uniform, I mean where there's lots of energy spread on both sides, as we begin to educate them through our system, they tend to drift one way or the other. Uh, 
young girls tend to become more creative and emotional and that kind of thing, whereas boys are treated differently, so they become more analytical. And we're starting to see changes there finally. I mean, society is changing. But unfortunately, it's drifting more to the analytical side because these creative concepts in terms of um, utilizing technologies for the brain are not being applied. With the exception of the Minneapolis School District and some others now copying their program, they actually put in what's called brain biofeedback or neurobiofeedback systems. These systems allow, um, for, for instance, for children, because children are you know, a little bit tougher to work with, they, would make, they made these little helmets that kind of look like a bicycle helmet. They have electrodes in a number of locations to map or, or, or really monitor brain activity. Then on a screen, they might have something like a bouncing ball. And the idea is for the kid to learn how to bounce the ball into a certain range. In that ideal state for learning at will, something most of us can't even do, after a year, 80% of the student population within that school was off of all psychoactive drugs. No need for Ritalin anymore. They could move back in. A number of them, perhaps not 80% the first year, but a number of them, and eventually most of them were able to move into regular education classes. Now, you know, you think about that technology for the child and the parents, and it's phenomenal. It changes lives. Think about it from your own self-interest. If you're a taxpayer, it costs three, four, five times as much to educate a special needs child. This technology, be a committee of one and do something in your community. Contact the Minneapolis School District. Inquire about brain biofeedback and neurobiofeedback. There's 14,000 school districts in this country. Get the information to your school district and make a difference and apply the technology in the right way. In terms of the military of applications of this technology, we should view it from the lens in which it's focused. It's evil, it's wrong, it's an incorrect approach, it's about control, it's about power, it's about the very things that most principled people would stand against. The whole concept of, of this type of technology, when it's used properly, could offer great advantages on an individual basis. But when governments are, are in control, and again going back to Zbigniew Brzezinski's ideas, what he basically said in predicting in 1973, and if you read the book Between Two Ages, you'll see it, is he predicts the trends economically, socially, politically for the next 30 years. You read it today in 2005, and it's like a history of what has happened since 1973. In this particular area of technology, and this was the whole crux of the book, was the idea that technology would give greater and greater and greater control to governments over individuals, personal liberty, and freedom. And what Zbigniew said is no matter who was in power, liberal or conservative, the temptation to use this technology to further their own political ends would be greater than the good sense to refrain. And I think we've seen that. If you go back to the 60s, you'll see the MK Ultra programs, the 70s, the MK Ultra programs. These were mind control programs that are reported. Uh, you'll see the congressional report in 1975 when the CIA was investigated. They had used uh, chemicals, primarily hallucinogenics, on 8,000 servicemen, hundreds of civilians, unwitting victims of this technology. In fact, when you get into unwitting victims, you know, Secretary of Energy O'Leary under the Clinton administration said that over half a million Americans over a 40-year period had been victims of various kinds of human experimentation within the United States without consent. That's what they admit to. Yet not one single solitary soul has ever stood before a jury of their peers and been accountable for that, while at the same time at the end of World War II, human experiment on human beings resulted in hanging. <laughs> that was the penalty. Today it's hidden from public view. It's the secrecy syndrome that gets to the root of these issues that has to be pried open. We have to gain control of our government, and in, in modern society, what makes a government strong? It's the technology they command. So within a democratic republic, what makes people strong is dictating what those technologies translate to, not government imposing those technologies on us for abuse, for control, for manipulation, which is exactly what's happening today.